that's where it goes. Pastor Steve told me, Lance, stand in the middle. Don't go all over the place. I hope I can do that. We'll see. <sighs> Praise God. Well, we're in a series, as uh, Brent already said to you, we're in a series called One Another. And this week, I love what uh, actually Pastor Dennis said to me when he came in. He says, oh, Lance, you've got the easiest of topics. I said, I've got the hardest of topics. <laughs> because today we're talking about forgiving one another. So, and it's a very difficult topic because all of us have deep wounds and pain that we've gone through throughout our lives. All of us have stuff that we've held on to because, let's face it, we've all dealt with people. And people hurt other people. And hurting people hurt other people. And that creates resentment. It creates bitterness. And I know what, that, I know what that's like. I know what that feels like. So let's open up in a word of prayer. And we'll get started this morning. Father, I just thank you. And I praise you, Lord Jesus. I thank you for this topic of, on forgiveness. Lord, I pray that, Father, you would touch my lips. That you would touch my mind. That you would touch my heart. That you would anoint me. Lord, I have nothing to give these people except through your anointing, through your power, through the power of your Holy Spirit. So, Lord, I ask that you'd come, anoint your word, help me to communicate. And, Lord, if I reach one person today with the love of Jesus, I feel like I've done my job. Lord, we love you, we thank you, we glorify you. And I pray that we wouldn't just play church, but we would do church today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So the title of my message this morning is True Greatness, True Greatness. And the verse that we'll be working from is Ephesians 4.32. And if, uh, uh, as tradition, as uh, daybreakers, if you'll stand to your feet, we'll read this verse together. Please, if you can. It says in Ephesians 4.32, And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Hey, two for one, look at that. You may be seated. We'll be focusing on forgiving one another today. So my mom, when I was growing up, she had an ugly green turtle-shaped bowl that sat on top of her TV set in her bedroom. Now, some of you know my testimony. My mom worked... My mom worked 16 hours a day when we were kids. My, my parents were divorced when I was five years old. And my mom had custody of us. And she had to work two full-time jobs to be able to put a roof over our heads, clothes on our backs, and food on our table. So my brother and I, we would hang out in the trailer. And uh, that's where we lived. We lived in a trailer park. And back then, for you young people, TV sets were about 18 inches to two feet thick. They weren't, they're not flat screens like they are today. So you could put stuff on top of them, and she had this ugly green turtle-shaped bowl on there, and she would throw all of her coins in there. Uh, dimes, nickels, pennies, quarters, you name it. Well, since she was gone 16, 17 hours a day, we felt the liberty, my brother and I, to go and take money out of there. And in the trailer park back then, they don't have them so much anymore, they would have common areas, and in those common areas where people would hang out, play games, what have you, there would be soda machines. Well, you can just guess where my mom's change was going to. Fast forward about 30 years later. I don't know what I was doing, but I was doing something, and the Lord convicted my heart. He actually said, Lance, you've been stealing from your mother. And I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> I'm 40 years old. I don't steal from my mother. She goes, yeah, you did. He said, yeah, you did. You stole money from your mom from that, from that ugly green turtle-shaped bowl from the top of the TV set. And the Lord convicted my heart. And guys, it was so embarrassing to go to my mom at 40 years old. And I stood there, and I looked at her, and I said, hey, mom, can I tell you something? She goes, yeah, what, what is it? You know that ugly green turtle-shaped bowl that was on top of your TV set when, uh, when we were a boy? She goes, yeah. I just want you to know, I, I took money from that to buy soda, and it was wrong of me to do that. And I want to ask your forgiveness. She goes, Lance, 
and I know this isn't theologically correct, there's a whole process to forgiveness. You say you're sorry, then you ask for forgiveness, and then the other person's supposed to forgive you. It wasn't like that. It was just like, Lance, it's okay. It's okay. My thought is, is that she probably already knew that we were taking money <laughs> from there. So, to be great means to serve people by extending grace to others and asking for forgiveness when we've wronged someone else. Our sinful nature stands opposed to our created purpose to love God and to love one another, to love each other. But our sinfulness is not greater than God's mercy and grace. And because God served me by forgiving me of my sin, I should serve others by extending forgiveness to them. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, it's part of the Lord's Prayer. It says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And in Mark chapter 10, verses 44 and 45, Jesus said, and whoever of you desires to be first, some translations there say, whoever desires to be great among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is going to sound like heresy, what I'm about to say. Brent will have to take me off the stage here in a second. <laughs> but Jesus isn't just my king. Jesus is my servant. Jesus is my servant. He washed the disciples' feet in one of the greatest acts of, of servitude. He died on the cross for my sins in one of the greatest acts of servitude. How? Jesus served me at my greatest point of need by offering and opening the door to forgiveness. Jesus invested himself by opening the path to forgiveness for all of us. Forgiveness is our greatest need. Forgiveness requires a penalty to be paid. Look what it says in Hebrews 9.22. It says, according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or no remission of sin, as some translations say. Forgiveness can't be earned. I can't go to Walmart and say, hey, I'd like to buy forgiveness. I can't do that. Forgiveness has to be offered and it has to be accepted. We can't pay for forgiveness. Forgiveness has to be lived out daily. Emphasis on daily. And forgiveness has evidence. The evidence of forgiveness is a changed life. We don't need a resolution to make us great. At the beginning of the year, we make all these resolutions. Hey, I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to stop gossiping. I'm going to stop swearing. And three weeks later, guess what? We're in the same rut that we were before the year be, uh, ended, right? But we don't need a resolution to make us great. We need a solution to make us new. And that solution is Jesus Christ. To be great means to serve others by extending and asking for forgiveness. We need to forgive each other because Christ forgives us for everything. For everything. Remember, we are all hard to bear. I'm hard to bear. And you know what? If you're honest with yourself, you're hard to bear too. Last week, my wife and I got in an argument on the way up to our, our speaking engagement. And guys, it was bad. We got up there, and people asked us, well, how are you doing? Oh. <laughs> well, we got into an argument on the way up, and you know what? It doesn't feel very good right now. We had to be real and honest. You know why, guys? Because we're all hard to bear, right? And I'm sure maybe some of you maybe had an argument on the way into church this morning. Actually, one of the people told us last week, you know what? The, the biggest time we get into an argument seems like when we get in the car to come to church. Please don't tell me that they're the only ones. <laughs> We are all hard to bear. And Jesus knew this all too well. If anyone had the right to be bitter, it was Jesus. Look with me at Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. Long passage of scripture, but I'm going to jet right through this because it's Palm Sunday. Here we go. The triumphal entry. 
Now when they drew near Jerusalem to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and immediately he will send it here. So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street, and they loosed it. But some of those who stood there said to them, What are you doing, loosing the colt? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded, so they let them go. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it and sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lance, some of you are asking this. Lance, how could you connect the topic of forgiveness to the celebratory scene of Palm Sunday in Jesus, triumphal entry? Well, I'm glad you asked. You know, I thought about this for a long time. I did. I sat at the table when I was studying the Word of God, and I thought about this for a while. And the same people that were calling out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, are the same exact people who will be calling out for his death in four days. In Matthew chapter 27, verses 22 and 23, it says this, Pilate said to them, what then shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? Again, this is four days after the triumphal entry, people. They all said, let him be crucified. Then the governor said, what evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, let him be crucified. And while hanging on the cross, Jesus makes the most astonishing statement that still resounds throughout all human history. And it says in Luke 23, verse 34, Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Forgive them. And they divided his garments and cast lots. One of the most difficult lessons I've had to learn in life is that not everyone you meet is going to appreciate or respect you. I've had to learn to live with that. In Romans 12, 18, it says... If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men or with all people. And I'm still learning the art of letting it go. Letting it go? What does that mean, Lance? Well, Proverbs 19.11 gives us kind of the, the, the picture. Sensible people control their temper. They earn respect by overlooking wrongs. Guys, do we have the ability to overlook someone else's wrong, or do we hold on to that thing tight-fisted, never letting it go? A friend once told me when he was getting married, or when he had been married for a while, he told me, Lance, if I called my spouse out for everything they did wrong to me, we wouldn't have a marriage. Guys, isn't that true? Those that are married, if we called out our spouse for everything, that they, all those quirks that we hate, we don't really like, if we called them to the mat for every, every little thing they ever did, we wouldn't have a marriage. We wouldn't have a relationship. Don't allow people, persecution, sickness, lack of finances, and negative circumstances to make you an unforgiving and bitter person. Bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness, if it left unresolved, can hurt the person you were angry with, but in the end, it destroys you. Unforgiveness is just like cancer. It spreads, and then it metastasizes, and then it destroys. That's bitterness. That's unforgiveness. Haman, out of, out of unforgiveness toward one man, decided to take his hate out on an entire ethnicity, only to have his life cut short because of unresolved bitterness. Some of you are saying to yourselves right now, Reverend Lance, I can't do what you're about to ask me to do. You don't know what this person did to me. We haven't spoken in 5, 10, 20, or even 30 years. The person I hate is dead, but the pain feels like it happened yesterday. 
I submit to you this morning that your very relationship with God depends on your decision to lay your unforgiveness at the foot of the cross. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, Jesus said, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Guys, that's heavy stuff. We can't have a cancel culture attitude about this stuff. Cancel culture looks at you and said, if you do that once, then you're irredeemable. Guys, that's anti-biblical. People fail. People sin. And guys, we sin against each other. We need second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth chances. And saying to someone that, oh, I forgive you, but I don't respect you, that's not true forgiveness. Peter, when he was being reinstated, when he was being reinstated by Jesus, Jesus didn't say to him, you know what, Jesus, you denied me three times. I forgive you, but I don't respect you. Go and feed my sheep. That's not forgiveness. Receiving and extending forgiveness is central to the gospel. It's central to the whole Bible. And maybe this morning, if you're having a hard time letting go of that thing, that unforgiveness, that resentment, if you can't forgive that person or, or people that hurt you years ago, I wondered this morning, are we really a believer? Because forgiveness is central to the gospel. I've only spoken of this last week. But many of you know my testimony. I was sexually abused when I was a boy for, over, for a four-year period by a babysitter that my mom had hired. She didn't know. But... When I was 18 years old, I had just become a Christian. Three months prior, I was walking along in the neighborhood next to the airport. And a person called out. I was just nonchalantly walking along. A person called out and said, Lance, Lance, is that you, Lance? So I turned around, and guys, I nearly froze. It was the girl who had sexually abused me when I was a little boy. And as she was talking to me, I could tell she was on drugs or she had been drinking or both. It doesn't matter. But as she was wobbling there, just like this, guys, I swear to, I swear to God. He was, she was wobbling there. She said, you know what, Lance? You know all that stuff I did to you when you were a little boy? I'm sorry about that. Guys, I had a decision to make. I could have lambasted her. But I didn't. Something inside me. I was only a three-month-old. I was only a three-month-old Christian at that time. And guys, this isn't theologically correct for all you people who who study the Word of God. But I looked at her, and something inside of me said, "You know what? She is so messed up. She needs my forgiveness more than I need my healing right now." And I told her, "It's okay. It's okay." And I walked away. My healing would come later, guys. I am a different person than I was when I was 18 years old. I am not the same angry, bitter, resentful young man. And I know that. Why? It's because I've chosen to forgive. Some of you cannot change because you're holding on to that thing and you refuse to let it go. A young lady in the Philippines asked Kim on and I, we, did a pro we showed you a program of this a few months ago of those ladies who were sexually assaulted. She said, if I forgive the man who sexually assaulted me, does that mean that he's free from the consequences of what he did to me? I answered, no. But by extending forgiveness, you are freeing yourself from the consequences of a life filled with anger, bitterness, hatred, resentment, and unforgiveness. It's exactly what I told her. Forgiveness opens the door to healing, guys. Forgiveness and healing are not the same thing. They are totally separate. Forgiveness is instantaneous. Healing takes time, and for some of us, it takes a lifetime. And I get that. Maybe some of you have been verbally, physically, or sexually abused. Maybe you've been violated. 
Perhaps even a loved one has passed away and you blame God for it. Maybe someone said something untrue about you and it has affected other relationships. How about abandonment? A mother, a father, a spouse or ex-spouse, a close friend left you in a real moment of need and you're thinking to yourself, I can't get close to anyone again. It's not worth getting hurt. Don't let another day, week, month, year go by. Resolve unforgiveness now before it's too late. And guys, there is a too late. How do I do that? Run to the cross. People who are broken are the first to run to the cross. In Luke chapter 18, verses 13 and 14, this is what it says. Or I'll just say it. Oh, there it is. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. If you've sinned, ask God for forgiveness. Ask God to forgive you for allowing unforgiveness into your heart. If it's safe to do so, be the first person to initiate the reconciliation process. You be the first. We're all called to be ambassadors for Christ. We're all called to the ministry of reconciliation. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. We're called to that ministry. And try to live at peace with everyone. In 2 Timothy 2.23, it says, But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. Do you run headlong into strife? Or do you, or do you go a different way? Do you walk to a different beat? Do you walk to the beat of Jesus? If the other person gives permission, bring a mediator to help resolve the matter. Someone you both agree on who is fair and objective. If you hurt the other person, ask for, forgive, ask for their forgiveness. Offer restitution if you've damaged their property or livelihood. Oh, Lance, that's Old Testament. Baloney. Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus actually said to Jesus, look, I'll give back four times what I cheated. Every, I'll give back four times um, what I stole from, the, from these individuals. And Jesus replied to them, salvation has come to this household. If the person you are trying to reconcile with is unreceptive, pray for him or her. You've done all you can do. I want to end on one more story. Before I go into the challenge, which I know will be difficult, and I get it. But I was sitting with a good friend, and I'm not going to tell you who, he, who the person is because you guys know who the person is. But he said to me across the table at Zachary's Pizza one night, he said, Lance, when my wife and I got together, we knew we were messed up people. We were very messed up. Our families were messed up, and we were messed up. But when we got married, we made a vow. I want you to listen to this. We made a vow to forgive each other for the rest of our lives. Lance, I've been married 28 years. And I have physically abused my wife. I have verbally abused her. But you know what? We've always come back to that vow. That we would forgive each other for the rest of my life. This person is way different, by the way, now than he was way back, you know, maybe year five or year ten in his marriage. I want you to hear this. I know there are broken marriages here, this, uh, here today. I know that there's people here dealing with some really incredible stuff. Maybe you've got financial issues. Maybe you can't agree on how to discipline kids. Maybe there's chemistry issues. Maybe there's infidelity. Maybe there's anger in the household. I don't know what it is. So guys, the Bible commands us that we need to forgive one another. And if Jesus said it, it's possible. At this time,